ready? Come on, push. The story's all there. It's, it's gone actually pretty much the way I thought it would because between the story and the pre-interviews, I knew what it was about, so. The visuals are the ones I'm a little more worried about because the lighting wasn't as good as it should be. Um, we've since discovered there's a shutter s setting on the camera that we didn't know about, um, and that was creating some of our problems. So, um, I don't know, you have to work as a team, and everybody has different amounts of experience with the camera. Some have used it a lot, some haven't, so you just have to go with what you've got. I'm going to uh, do the paper edit myself, then I will hand that to Emmanuel, who will do all the editing, and then I'll come in just to do the voicer, and it's all done. And all the close-ups. So I picked, obviously, an establishing shot from one, and a mid shot from one, and a close-up from one. Uh. So we could do, but we'd have to make sure we didn't use the same ones that we use later on. That works, huh? Everything after this is so easy, it's just this friggin' opening, it's a pain in the butt. Before you start editing, here's some housekeeping you should take care of first. When your shooting is complete, screen and log your field tapes. Make a shot list. Write down the time code locations of all your good shots with a brief shot description. Identify actuality sound ups, interview clips, and stand ups so you don't waste time hunting for them in the edit suite. It's also a good idea to note the length of your best clips and visuals. When putting together a long form current affairs piece, transcribe your interviews. Once you've screened and shot listed your footage, what are the pictures telling you? Visualize how you can build the story with the material you shot. The surgery was a complete success. This is the time to make changes to your story structure on paper. Here's how you do a paper edit. Select your best story elements and organize them into chronological order, a story progression that unfolds the way you see and hear the story going to air. Write down the time code location of every shot. The cutaway doesn't go there though, because she's already finished, right? The cutaway goes in in between. Like I want this. The cutaway's gotta go between those two shots. No, no, but I don't want Armed with a paper edit, finished, you now have a blueprint for editing. What about your narration script? Writing the pictures. Well, there are two ways to go about this, and there is an ideal way and a not-so-good way. And in fact, uh, I'm sorry to say that the not-so-good way is the one that has won out in news uh, reporting. And that is where the reporter sits down at a typewriter or a com computer these days and bashes out a script and then takes that script into the, uh, into the, uh, into the audio booth, narrates it, and then goes into the editing suite, and they put the narration and the clips of interview clips together, and that's it. And, that's, and there's no sense of creation. What's missing is a sense of creation, OK? And this is really important, because the better way, the old way, and the way it used to be done in news um, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, when I was learning the craft, that's just how we used to do it. What we would do is we would have a, an edit script. We'd know approximately what we would say at a certain point, but we wouldn't write it yet. What we would do is we would go into the editing suite, and we'd build the pictures first. We'd build that visual narrative, and we'd have the, narr the visual sequences unfolding, blending in with actuality, into a clip, out of a clip, a lying space for a bit of narration, but back into maybe some more actuality, back out over a visual sequence, a montage maybe. And then, as a final step, because the words are the most flexible tool that a reporter has, then we would write the script to time, to match the pictures, to interpret the pictures, to add on to the pictures, but not, never, to dominate the pictures. You can leave just Olympic naturally. Olympic-style so. weightlifting isn't a typical sport for women. No, see, you wouldn't start voicing until now. Olympic-style weightlifting isn't a typical sport for women. But then, Lisa Regan is anything but typical. Regan has been involved in competitive sports all her life. And then I gotta cut to the soccer ball. That's perfect. She's been playing soccer since she was five, and was even asked
When a viewer is watching a piece on television, the element that is going to make the most impact and the most lasting, give them the lasting impression are going to be the, the visuals, the, the pictures that are in front of them. Freeze the feet! Freeze the feet! The next thing that is going to stay with them are going to be the interview clips and the actuality. If you manage to get into school, you end up with a massive debt and basically students are yeah, graduating into poverty. So the thing that has the least uh, impression on the viewer, or that they're least conscious of anyway, is, are, are the words, the, uh, the script that the reporter writes. Unfortunately, what happens is that for, for many reporters, their, their effort goes in disproportionately to what the viewer gets. So they spend a lot of time writing and uh, crafting, these, crafting these beautiful sentences and then trying to make the pictures and trying to make the interview clips fit into what they've written. What, uh, what we try to do, at least in, you know, in documentary, and, and in news as well, is let the, let the visuals tell the story so that they are the primary source of information, and uh, a, as are the interviews and the, and the natural sound and the clips. But there are, there are still reasons to write, to write a script. Sometimes you have to add context or analysis, or you have to add details that, uh, that your interview subjects couldn't put in or, or that are pertinent to, to the story. Or you have to add maybe a sense of atmosphere or a sense of mood that, uh, that you couldn't quite capture with, with your visuals. And all of these things um, can, be, can be crafted into, into a script as long as they are you know, seen as accompanying the visuals. So they aren't there to overpower the visuals. <laughs> Here's a story that's, uh, that you probably see on you know, the news almost any given night. It was a story of a student protest. And, uh, and the, the visuals that you see at the top are students chanting and, uh, and holding signs um, that say, uh, stop tuition fee rise. So the reporter wrote, From megaphones to picket signs, over 100 Carleton students protested against rising tuition fees last week. So basically they're describing exactly what's on there. Then they go on to say, Following the protest, students marched to Robertson Hall to give Carleton President Richard Van Loon over a thousand signatures against the tuition hikes. That's a very long sentence, but again, basically describing word for word exactly what you're seeing on the screen. As opposed to describing perhaps the mood of the students, you know, um, uh, or, you know, victorious with, uh, with petitions, uh, with a thousand signatures in the hand, they went to the person who perhaps could do something about tuition fees. I'm just writing off the top of my head. But uh, trying to capture the mood as opposed to describe word for word what the students are, are actually doing. Your story should be built around what you're seeing in the viewing suite. While you may have an idea in terms of script, which way the story is going, you may start looking at it and go, geez, you know, that, that video is kind of boring. Uh, and so maybe you change your story based on, uh, you know, what kind of video content you have or, or, or at least uh, structure it differently. Well, I have a real prejudice for using clips and, uh, and actuality to drive your story. Uh, I try to keep my voiceover to a minimum and uh, it's, a, it's a constant battle how much of your voiceover you use. Often you need it and I, I'm certainly not a person who, I don't, I rarely do stories that don't have any voiceover in them um, just because I, I, I think it's often important to uh, keep a story from getting confusing. You know, your actualities don't end up being exactly what you thought they were going to be or they don't. The person isn't articulate enough to, to drive the story and so you need to fill in some of the gaps. They came to say goodbye to a 10-year-old boy today. Parents, relatives and many friends of Vivek Debedin. Okay, you ready, Jim? I'm Diane Duffy. Later on the health beat, a person. Okay. I'm Diane Duffy. Later on the health beat, a personal experience of an embarrassing, painful problem. So what we know is that Diane will be on ESPN. Thank you. Thank you. The top 20% first commercial break. Okay. At 6:32, Diane Duffy is here with her health beat and a story tonight about an embarrassing bladder condition. I go to the bathroom about 30 times a day. And I seem to spend a good part of my day in there. What do you do in there? <laughs> Pee. <laughs> yes. You spend your whole life. I just felt like this I is a piece that we're going to put on the air tonight. Jennifer plates. has done most of the work assembling it and putting it together. We've looked at it once, 
And we're gonna look at it now again with a little bit more critical eye to make sure it's what we want. All the way through. And really, I'm working from she words. Also finds uh, words on a page, a transcript that I do. I spend a lot of time looking at the tapes and making notes to myself all the way through. And I, I, I come out with a shot list. This one's probably 20 pages long, and it's you know it's only four or five tapes, and there are bits that I really like and bits that I don't like very much, and I make so some notes. So once you've got the light and you've got everything hooked up, if it's a normal bladder, what do you see? Normal bladders are kind of peachy colored. Uh, they have little blood vessels that you can see through them. Uh, the blood vessels I look at the tapes for a long time, sometimes, you know, about eight hours. And I'm looking at them for what are the actual words. But, but more than that, what are the pictures saying to me? What are the, what are the people in the story saying to me? And how can I structure this in a, in a dramatic way, in an interesting way? The pain was excruciating. I had no idea what was going on with me. Okay, where do those different things represent those little different... Uh... <laughs> well, it's kind of a unique uh, way of structuring a story. Um, the color-coded post-its represent people that I'm talking to in the story. The blue ones here are the main character, Ann Reyna, and her, her problem. The orange ones are the doctor, and the uh, yellow ones are, are me, just uh, voicing over and connecting. So what I like to do when I, I'm structuring a story or when I'm thinking about how I'm going to tell a story, I usually like to have the subject uh, talk about that in his or her own words as much as possible. Um, and then I try not to have a big role in the story other than to move it along and to tell the story. I really like stories better when they're told by the people who are actually involved. And nobody else seemed to know what was going on either. I had all kinds of doctors telling me it was in my head. And then all the thinking is done and you just kind of, I just kind of word process it into a script that the editor can follow and uh, that my producer can follow to have a, have a look at the story. Here's what I do. I usually, um, this is the script for the story on interstitial cystitis. And, um, Lots of clips here, and I tell the editor the kind of pictures that I want to go over some of these clips. Uh, there it is. No. is it there? There. Could we could we freeze it or slow mo that shot so it doesn't go up and down? So once you've got it's not rocket science. It's a little bit like cooking. You're throwing in a little dish of here and a little bit of humor there and some explanation here and. Uh, you hope that you've done it in the right sequence and given it enough time to cook so that what you've got is something that's really nice. What kind of a day has it been in here today? <laughs> hectic, really hectic. Well, that's what we're going to do. My preparation comes because I've done most of the work in the story myself. I know what I'm saying. I could deliver the script if uh, the teleprompter died and I didn't have a piece of paper. I could still introduce it with a fair degree of, uh, of confidence and, um, and style because I know the story. That's it. Number two, Peter. Ready, Diane, what promo? Ready, Diane? Diane? Now, and Diane, your story tonight is about pain, frustration, and frequent trips to the washroom. Thank you, Peter. For most women, a bladder infection is a fairly simple ailment to cure. You visit the doctor. It's kind of like acting, you know. Sometimes, if you look like you know what you're doing, you convince people that you know what you're doing. What I do is I, I, I read it a couple of times, but I know it. Lint, lint, lint. I know what the story is. Lunch. And it's just a question of standing up there, opening okay, my mouth, and delivering it. Cool. Have a good show. Thanks. And they can be told their problem is all in their head. I go to the bathroom about 30 times a day. Cut one, take three. In five, four, three, Two, one. Olympic style weightlifting isn't a typical sport for women, but then Lisa Regan is anything but typical. 
Regan has been involved in competitive sports all her life.